So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to start by, from the beginning by saying how much I appreciate what you are all doing. And uh, echo what Fernando said earlier, that uh, work on rare diseases, rare tumors, could not be done without active patient participation. So uh, thank you so much for everything you're doing. So I'm a medical geneticist um, who previously was trained in adult and then pediatric endocrinology, um, board certified pediatrician. Uh, what I do in my lab is try to identify genes for endocrine tumors. And so in uh, 2005, I uh, approached Dr. Carmen, Ada Carmen, who was in the Mayo Clinic, and with whom I have had a long relationship because my lab has identified genes for a couple of other uh, diseases that Dr. Carney has been working with. And uh, I said to him, I've heard that there's this disease, Carney's trapping, that you have also uh, described that sounds very interesting because to me that I have been working on genetics of endocrine tumors for so long. This was the only disease I knew, and to this day, it's still true. The only disease I knew that associated uh, paracanthriomas and pheochromocytomas with what I had been studying up until 2005, and I still study my lab, adrenocortical tumors. Amazing. These two components of the adrenal gland two very different components. One comes from the sentinel stem, uh, from the, the sentinel cells, that's the adrenal cortex, and the other component comes from the neural crest, this is the neuronal cells. So we call that part medulla, and it forms the few chromocytomas. And the few chromocytomas are cousins uh, of pyrogangliomas. They are all derived from neural crest cells. So the adrenal develops on the 14th or so embryonic day, and then the medulla comes in on the about the 21st embryonic day of the human embryo as it forms, and it migrates the, the medullary cells, the neural crest cells, from the spine. I mean, how these two cell populations that are so different that even migrate to that location on top of a kidney get tumors in the same organ? Up to that point, after the description of the current triad, Nobody had ever seen an adrenocortical tumor, stem, uh, the sentinel cells, and a neural crest tumor, fear from cytoma, together. So I said to Dr. Kahn, this must be very interesting. Let me just dig more into your disease, if you allow me to. Went up to Mayo Clinic, got the records, and then realized that um, uh, these patients were unique. Not only they have this amazing combination of a neural crest tumor and a sentinel tumor in the same organ in the front gland, but they also had other tumors. They were all 90% female. And unlike what Dr. Carney thought, that this must be inherited, he was right that this is genetic. And I would argue, Dr. Ruth, that everything is genetic. <laughs> um, he was right that it was genetic. But he was wrong in that it was always inherited. Because as we all now know, and as Dr. Ruth said, most of these cases are epigenetic, but it is still genetic. <laughs> it is a different type of genetic, it's still genetic. Uh, so these cases, I, I said, this is, must be very unique. This, so this is the beginning for me anyway. 2005, I put in a grant. We call this Bench to Bedside of Word. And I get funding to do the study, to get the data from Dr. Carney, and started the work at the NIH. Here is the first patient of Dr. Carney uh, presented in New England Journal of Medicine that had uh, the paraglioma, the gastrointestinal stromal tumor, uh, fibromocytoma, adrenocortical tumors, and other hematomas. And look at her deficient ear. Many of you that have come to the clinics, I just practice classic clinical genetics, and always look at you. Freckles you have, I look at the skin types you have, I look at the birthmarks you have, because I'm, and I have a complete database of the various things that I have seen in the patients with current drive. 
And there are many actually, they're not uh, all reported yet. Here is the adrenals of these patients, the thing that attracted me first. You can see both cortical tumors and uh, pheochromocytomas. And here is, of course, a full blown picture of a patient with cardiac triad that has uh, the pulmonary chondromas, um, the gastrointestinal stromal tumors, and the paracanglioms. The disease got Dr. Carney's name in this paper. This was published in the American Journal of Medicine, um, June 1981. A, a physician from Mayo Clinic who knew Dr. Carney uh, called the condition progress threat, and this is how we refer to it to this day. So uh, about uh, 10 years ago, we put together all our patients and we realized that adrenocortical tumors were present in up to 13% of the patients. Uh, it was amazing to me that you could find at the same time a functioning uh, cortical tumor producing cortisol and a functioning fibrocytoma. Just amazing. Some patients, now I know this is the pediatric group, uh, and this is a pediatric disease or a young adult disease. Most patients present before the age of 30. Most patients present sometime between 15 and 25. The youngest I have seen is a six-year-old. The oldest I have seen is this one, 49-year-old. So here is a patient, amazing, look at this, perfectly healthy, Sweden. This patient was in Sweden. Goes to the ER, simple coffee, they do an x-ray, they find all these multiple lung tumors, and then they start doing scans. <laughs> and I mean, I've seen, I, I wouldn't have liked to be in her position. She's told by her doctors, she has a tumor there, and a tumor there, and a tumor there. I mean, the question is, where don't I have a tumor? Uh, so it can go as late as 49. It's very important, now that we know more about the disease, to screen patients carefully. You can see how you can go undiagnosed, amazing, all the way to 49. That explains why in the younger groups of patients, in the earlier reports, you had some sudden deaths. We should not let that happen, not today, not with everything we know about these diseases. So as part of this funding, uh, we very quickly did, you know, this is technology, of course, now that's 12 years old. We did uh, fluorescent incipient hybridization. We, identif we uh, realized that this disease was most likely mosaic, and so we had to develop our own method to develop, to identify tumor cells within a mixture of normal cells. We call this somatics, published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. And very quickly identified that the most common uh, defect in these patients were on chromosome 1. So this is the origin of where today we go to ASTHC. That's how we focused on ASTHC. And that's why we also focused on ASTHC. The two most common alterations in our tumors was uh, where 1P, uh, which is where SDHP is, and 1Q21, where SDHC is. It is in this location, in SDHC, that we then describe. So we started doing a collaboration with a German group and that was doing methylomics at the time. Again, technology was old, much older than what Keith used later um, at the NIH. But we very quickly discovered in the methylomics analysis of these tumors that the patients with Carmen's triad, and this was the first demonstration of STHC methylation, this implementation thing. The patients with Carmen's triad had in all their tumors, but not in their normal tissue, the specific methylation of the STHC promoter. It's a CPG island where CTCF uh, by transcription factor binds. That is where the methylation, the methylation is. Um, and uh, as was just said, absolutely true, these patients have methylation elsewhere. Uh, Keith and his group have described this very nicely in the uh, wild type gist. Uh, it is also true in the tumors of Carnage right? They have methylation everywhere. But not all the tumors that are SDH uh, deficient have, that have methylation everywhere have the SDHC epimethylation. That methylation of the SDHC promoter is a molecular signature, which we now know is also true for wild type tests, as Keith described, but it was first described in this current trial patients. Uh, and that shows this data. I don't want to tie it. This is 
Uh, the work that Keith um, did. And I'll, I'll let Keith speak about his work. Now, we also discovered a few patients with carnitine tribe. Now, this is now going to show you something quite remarkable. A few patients with carnitine tribe did, in fact, have germline suction of dehydrogenous mutations. We reported this uh, with a group here uh, in the European Journal of Hematomatics. But what is remarkable is that even in these patients that have a germline suction of dehydrogenous mutation and that have carnitine tribe, this peculiar disease, this is a germline defect. So if you have STHB mutation and you have carnitine triad, why don't you inherit the disease? The truth is that these patients do not inherit the disease. So they, we have about 10 patients, 9 patients, with suction dehydrogenous mutations that have carnitine triad. They come from families that have suction dehydrogenous mutations. And they have kids with suction dehydrogenous mutations. Here's their families. But only a single case in each one of these families that we see there has carnitine triad. What does that tell you? It's what I told you before. You have the germline defect, SDHA, let's say, but then you need that molecular signature, the SDHC, CPT island promoter methylation, to develop carnitine triad. And that, the correct the truth, is not inherited. That is genetic, but it's not inherited. It is epigenetic. Somehow it happens. And so my lab continues to work and try to identify what is the factor, because almost certainly it is a factor, and we don't know what the factor is. But what is the factor that, boom, puts in that signature in that tissue cell and tells that tissue now, it's not paraganglioma anymore and just alone. Now you have carnitine triad. Now you're going to develop hamartomas elsewhere, anywhere. We were very quick to identify sexual reproductive mutations in these patients, published this in human cell offensive, and this was the first demonstration of sexual reproductive mutations in tests. It was, uh, this paper was the first demonstration of any subcomponent. And it was remarkably the same year that glyomas were found in mutations in isocyte and hydrogenases. But glyomas were not so common. So this was the first of comma that was viewed in my That's why this paper was published. That's it. It was when this paper came out that Dr. Kim came to me and said, we are thinking of doing the clinic. I know you published this. Let's put it together. And the year was put down something. So the paper you can see, I think, came out. About that year, this is what it all happened, and that's how I came to it. So that's clear in the clinic. Uh, we demonstrated the importance of the suction hypnosis mutation in wild type fists. And the rest is history. I don't want to repeat what has been said. I do want to say one more thing, though, uh, before I close. I don't want to repeat things that um, I was considering. Um, and I will be presenting tomorrow to the commissions about the bifurcating work of the section of endogenous mutations and their contribution to other kinds of materials. But um, uh, as I saw these patients, I realized that a few of the patients were seeing had mutated tumors. And now I knew that if I called this something that nobody would be able to pronounce, they would get my name again. So, for the name of the first author of the paper. Um, and so I named this condition 3PAS. Pituitary adenoma, paraglioma, and furans. So I check the literature, you will see Google now. 3PAS is now used by all as the association of paraglioma, furans, cytoma, and pituitary adenoma. And this is another endocrine tumor that's part of the suction hypertrogenous phenotype. Now, uh, Lee said something this morning about, oh, it's confusing, but it's got a tag, it's got a tag, but it's the BAS. Now, I'm careful, I'm a geneticist. And in genetics, we never call a symptom a symptom if it's not a symptom. I didn't call a cardiac I call it from 
we don't work on real life athletes, we don't want to die. Like so somebody else called me and said, I would hire you in San Francisco. The reason I didn't call the association, it's an association, of Pituitary and Yamas, who the fire of Yamas of the National Council, it's an association. Why is this important? Because as, um, what I'm trying to point out is what you were saying this morning, these are allelic events of the same cluster of genes. Think of 600 androgenous enzyme with four genes, different chromosomes, so ancient genes that have evolved over many, many, many millions of years, present in my most favorite organism, the yeast of next line, the STHC, uh, so early in evolution. These genes contribute to mitochondrial oxidation. The most important, I would argue, factor besides nuclear production, the cell. And what you are seeing these facts, these four genes, one or another way, germline, epigenetic, epigenetic, interestingly, in the most ancient of the four subunits, STHC, to develop different associations. That's what I see. And why the variability? Because all of us have another 21,996. And we have variants in these other genes that probably regulate, as well as perhaps RNAs, microRNAs, long RNAs, and so forth. Here's the here's the line of the world. So you don't really have a symptom that's caused by suction of the hydrogen Anybody who says that is wrong. We have different associations. That is why the few families that have been described with the ST mutations are on cancer, very few of them have genes. Why? Very few of my patients with paraganglionomas, fibromyalgiomas, and you may have one. Right. Very few do. But the point is, not few. Why? Why among the wild type just families, there are very few fibromyalgiomas? Ask the professor. Why in his fibromyalgioma and paraganglioma families, only few have cysts? Why? It's not a good explanation. I have what I just told you. That we were looking at a collection of genes that are affected by the uh, genetic factor. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank again everything, everybody who is here, but also of course uh, uh, the NCI. It's very happy to be uh, my lab. I want to point out that none of this, at least my world, would have been possible without uh, Dr. Carney's contribution at the very beginning, giving me, giving me access to his tumors, to his patients, and to the mayor of the uh, The work really was funded by the NIH principal insight mechanism back in 2005, uh, and um, Dr. Kim's contribution was absolutely essential in getting me involved. To this day, uh, we continue this work, although it's a small part of our lab. Um, I'm mostly interested in finding out what causes this epigenetic change. Um, and to that effect, I would like to ask you to send me fresh. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I have 